Praise the Lord. We're glad that you're here today. Um, we're just a little bit incapacitated with this uh, rototuff repair that they did on my shoulder. Alicia uh, did her surgery well Friday, but she's uh, very sore today and uh, just has to lay flat. So she's doing okay. Just keep her in your prayers. She'll heal them up like she's supposed to. Brother Bascom is scheduled to come home tomorrow. So just keep him in your prayers. And um, I think that's it as far as I know. Um, but we're going we're gonna to do the best we can with uh, our limited range. And we're going to start off with there's power in the blood. Hallelujah. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or the love victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood. got COVID, and so keep her in your prayers today as she heals up. Praise the Lord. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for cleansing to Calvary's time. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood. There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you serve us for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily as praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power. Power, power. 
Bible, turn to the book of Exodus chapter 14, Exodus 14, beginning in the 10th verse, Exodus 14, in the 10th verse, and when 
Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians who you see today... You will see again no more forever. And the Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. I don't know how it is at your house, but it seems like at my house, we stay under an attack of the devil. It just seems like we go from this thing to that thing to another. I feel like I'm playing whack-a-mole. I get rid of this problem and another one pops up its head. And we get rid of this problem and we whack it down in the name of Jesus and it's gone. And something else takes its place. And what it really truly boils down to is this. The devil hates you and me and he wants to discourage you and he wants to keep you down. He wants to keep you frustrated and lonely and grieving and in and, and, and all types of, of depression. And if he can keep you down and get you discouraged, number one, you won't be effective in the kingdom of God. And number two, you won't be obeying the Lord because you're so filled with what's going on in your current circumstances that you can't move to listen to the voice of the Lord to do what he tells you to do. Or you don't feel like doing it because you're so focused again on those circumstances. And thirdly, you might just backslide and go to hell. And so the devil wants to do all of those things. John 10 and 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and life more abundantly. He didn't say, I'm going to come so you can be problem free. He just said, you're going to have life and life more abundantly. You're going to be able to go through the trials and through the difficult times and through the sicknesses and through the financial difficulties and through the relationship issues and through all the stuff that we go through on a normal basis. And it will be an abundant life. You'll have the peace of God that passes all understanding fill in your heart and mind. Well, the Israelites were in a situation. They had just seen the ten plagues that had fell on the Egyptians. And you would think that just seeing those ten plagues would be enough to carry them the rest of their life. But you and I are just like the Egyptians. We're up on the mountaintop and then we're down in the valley. We're up on the mountaintop and we're down in the valley. And we just get on this roller coaster of emotions. And God would love for his people just to be stable and steady no matter what happens in your life. These Egyptian or these uh, Israelis were were depressed because they forgot the ten plagues. They forgot that the waters had just parted and and that they walked across on dry ground and that Pharaoh and his army had drowned in the waters of the Red Sea. They forgot how God had provided manna and God had provided water and God had taken care of them. But here they are in a situation. And they're, they're very afraid. The word says they're very afraid. Have you ever just been scared to death about what you're going through? Scared you're going to die? Scared you're never going to get better? Scared you're going to have to go to a nursing home? Scared that you're just, your children are not going to step up to the plate and do what they're supposed to do? Scared that you're going to go under financially? Scared and afraid that you're never going to have a relationship? Scared that your spiritual walk is never going to get better than it is right now? And scared that this and that and more and more and more and more and more? 
The devil will put all kind of thoughts in your mind to keep a spirit of fear in you. I spoke to a person this week and I said to them, God did not give you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Mm -hmm. So you have power. You have love. You have a sound mind. And the devil's trying to tell you that you don't have any power, that, you're, that God doesn't love you, and that you uh, do not have a sound mind, a tormented mind. And I said, you have to keep quoting the scripture. You have to keep, quit, you have to keep quoting the word of God to make sure that you keep your faith where it ought to be. Hallelujah. God's people are hit on all sides. And we, like the world, are subject because the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust alike. We go through the same things the world goes through. Uh, there's no difference in us and the world as far as problems go. The difference ought to be, though, how we handle those situations. When we get that bad report from the doctor, when we get that news about a child that's in, in a bad situation, or we get those uh, uh, problems on the job, or we hear that a layoff is coming, or or there's going to be a difficulty in, in, in your job somehow. We should be different when we get those news reports. Well, the Israelites just forgot everything that they had seen. They forgot the word of God. They forgot everything that had been told to them. And the Bible says that they were afraid. It's human to be afraid. It's very human to be afraid and scared of what is coming your way. When, when the doctor says, oh, you've got this, and, and you know that you, you, you Googled it, and, and you know that there is no miracle cure for that situation, your mind begins to go to that place and you get so fearful. My mom and the Lord, Sister Garrett, one day I got a phone call from her neighbor and her neighbor said, uh, Pastor Richardson, she said, uh, uh, Sister Garrett is in extreme depression and it's nothing more than fear. She, there's really nothing wrong with her. It's just fear. And the fact that she's, you know, at that point, I think she was probably in her mid-90s. And, uh, you know, when you get a sickness in, in your 90s, you begin to think, is, is this it? Is this the, is this the time the, the conductor's going to punch my ticket and take me out of here? You know, and, and she just began to be fearful. And so I, I, I went down there to where she lived, and I told her, I said, Sister Garrett, you're coming home with me. And I picked her up, and I I put her in my uh, van and I drove her to the house. And for the first few days, she was just so filled with fear. I'd never seen her like that because she's always such a positive person, such a powerful person. And to see her in that condition, it was disheartening a little bit. But she was human like the rest of us. And so I prayed and I said, God, how? what do I say to my spiritual mother? How do I tell her that she's eat up with fear? What? What, what can I do? And the Lord just said, just tell her just like that. And so I, I, I went to her room and, and I made sure she was awake. And I said, Mom Garrett, are, are, you, are you struggling with fear? And she said, yes, I am, son. I'm, I'm just tormented in my mind. And I said, well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray because God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. Boy, that same scripture I quoted another individual, actually two individuals this week, the same exact word. But I said, I, I said to her, we're going to, we're going to put you back on the saddle and get your mind off of your, how you feel, and get your mind back on what you're supposed to do. And uh, so she said, oh, I'm not able to do I said, oh, yes, you are. I said, your mouth is working mighty good right now. <laughs> and I said, so no disrespect, but uh, put your house coat on. I'm sitting in a chair in the living room. Well, I called two or three new converts on the phone, and I said, uh, I need you to come to the house. And so we had a group session with all three of them, plus Mom Garrett and and, and we just sat there, and I started talking about the Word of God with these three new converts. And it weren't 
even four or five minutes tops, that Holy Ghost hit her and her mind started engaging with the Word of God and she began to implant in each one of those three people the Word of God from 70 some odd years of ministry. And as she began to share the Word of God and was operating in her anointing and her call, she got well. Well, by that evening, she was sitting at the table eating a regular meal. And the next several days, I kept having new people come over to the house so, so she could minister to them. It helped me, and it helped her. And praise the Lord. The Word of God will devour fear if you can just make that Word become alive and real in your spirit. Well, the Bible says then that the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. The only prescription when you're afraid is to cry out to the Lord and say, God, I am so afraid. I'm scared I'm not going to walk again. I'm scared I'm not going to talk again. I'm scared that I'm going crazy. I'm scared that I'm going to die. I'm scared that I got this disease. I'm scared my bank account's never going to recover. I'm scared, blah, 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 whatever it is that you're scared of. You begin to cry out to the Lord and let him know what you're afraid of. See, the Lord wants to comfort you today. When these little girls was small, and they got afraid of something. They'd come running into the bedroom. And uh, Alicia and I would uh, maybe be there watching TV or reading or whatever. And, and, and uh, they'd come in the room and they'd say, I'm scared. And I'd say, come here. And they'd sit in my lap and I'd say, what you scared of? And they'd say, there's a man under my bed. <laughs> <laughs> or some other foolishness, some monster in my closet or whatever it might have been. I'm not quite sure. There were so many. But um, just normal kid stuff. And I'd pull them up and I'd hug them. And I'd say, if there's nothing in there and you're going to be fine. And we'd go back and we'd look under the bed. There weren't no man there. We'd look in the closet. There weren't no monster there. And I'd say, see, it's nothing there. I was willing to comfort my children and grandchildren. And that's what God is wanting to do if we cry out to him. He's not going to turn a deaf ear. Wouldn't it have been horrible as a parent if I'd have said, get back to your room and face that old guy under your bed. <laughs> Here's a knife. Go stab him and get back to sleep. <laughs> Here's a baseball bat. Go hit him in the head and then go on back to bed. Wouldn't that have been a good father and grandmother? Wouldn't that have been wonderful of me? No, it would not. And that's not natural. If a parent does that, there's something wrong with them. Because a normal, loving parent when a child comes to them, you, you, you just let a two-year-old, just they don't even know what they want. They're just crying because they, they're sleepy or they're tired or they don't know what, they don't even know what's wrong with them. And they just put their hands up and, and, and you know what to do, don't you? You pick them up. They put them little arms up. You don't say, put them arms down. I ain't picking you up. No, you don't do that. You pick them up and you hold them and you comfort them and you love them. That's exactly what God, the Father, wants to do in yours and my life when we're in the middle of a battle and we are crying out to the Lord. He is not ignoring our cries. He hears our cries. Verse 11 uh, or, or verse 12, they, they began to say, um, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to have been slaves than to go through what we're going through now. And, and, and some people, especially if they've been on alcohol or drugs or, or perversion or anything else that they've run to every time they've been in a crisis, a lot of people run back to those things. And they're like, well, that's, that's what brought me comfort in the past, a bottle or, or dope or, or, or shooting up or whatever it was that brought them peace. And, and they'll run back to those things to bring peace back in their heart. They begin to rationalize in their minds and they begin to say, it would be better if this happened or that happened, or, or I can do this, or I can do that, or I will get another credit card, or, or, or I'll do this, or I'll do that. And, and their mind begins to rationalize. And the brain takes over the spirit, and it should be the opposite. Our spirit should take over the brain and tell our brain, this is what the Word of God says. 
Moses said to the people, verse 13, do not be afraid. Now, you know, it's easier said than done sometimes. You know, don't be afraid. Be a good cheer. Uh, there was a cartoon many years ago of Peanuts. Uh, there was Charlie Brown and Linus and, and uh, uh, Lucy, I think her name is Lucy. And, and they were all walking and, and poor old Snoopy was up to his neck in snow. He, he, his doghouse got snow on it and he was sitting up there and he was full of snow up to here. And, and they all started talking amongst themselves saying, what can we do to encourage Snoopy? And one said, I know what we'll do. And they all walked up to him and they said, be of good cheer, be of good cheer. And then they walked on the last little cartoon box, Snoopy still up to here and stuff. They didn't have him a bit. Just saying, be a good cheer, be a good cheer. And when somebody's pouring out their heart to you and they're telling you their problems and they're going through all the stuff that the devil's doing in their life, and we say, well, don't be afraid. <laughs> the fact of just saying don't be afraid is not enough. We have to follow it up with the word of God. I was ministering to an individual over the last several weeks, and and uh, I keep bringing this one scripture, Philippians 4.13, that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. They're struggling with strength, and they're struggling with being able to do what they need to do physically. And I said, you just put one foot in front of the other and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can take the next step. Uh, when Becca told me she had COVID yesterday, and, and uh, I didn't know if I could hit or miss some of the keys on the piano. I went over there and I said, devil, I don't have uh, Rebecca well enough to play, so I'm going to have to do it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Lord, you're just going to have to help me. And my fingers went to the right keys more so yesterday than they were doing this morning. <laughs> but anyway, we got through it. But I have to quote that scripture. Sometimes I have to write that scripture on a card and tape it to my dashboard and put it on my mirror in the bathroom and put it on the refrigerator, put it on the coffee pot, put it on places where you know you're going to go. Remind yourself of the Word of God. Get, I go sometimes to Google and I'll put, give me all the scriptures that have to do with peace. Give me all the scriptures that have to do with fear. Give me all the scriptures that have to do with whatever subject that I'm going through. And then I'll write them down, physically write them down. And then I'll take that page and I carry it with me. And from time to time throughout the day, I pull out my scriptures and I begin to read through them because it is the Word of God that changes our hearts. Becca said to me this week, she was planning on leaving the worship today. She said, what are you going to do if the Holy Ghost breaks out and you don't get to preach? I said, honey, if it's 3 o'clock and the Spirit of God is through, then I'm going to preach. I said, I am going to give the folks the Word of God. I don't care how long the worship goes. It is not worship that gets you through a hard time. It is the Word of God. It is the Word of God. Now, I love worship, and I worship privately and publicly, and and and, and, and that's wonderful. Getting slain in the Spirit is not going to uh, change your circumstances. It feels good for the time that, that you're in, in, enjoying it, but that doesn't get you through a hard time. It's quoting. This book is quoting this word of God, getting that word in your spirit, man, so that you can face whatever with a word. You might have to quote Isaiah 54, verse 17, that says, No weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue which rises against you in judgment you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. That's a promise you can hold on to. I'll, I'll speak to my finances and say, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. I'll speak to my health and I'll say, no weapon formed against me will prosper. I'll speak to my relationship issues and say, no weapon formed against me will prosper. And I'll believe it and trust the Lord with it. 1 John 4.4, 4, he says, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. And I remind the devil, devil, you're not greater than God. This situation's not greater than the Lord. 
My finances is not greater than God. My health is not greater than God. My mental condition is not greater than God. My situation with my family is not greater than God. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Greater is he that's within me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. I quote all of those scriptures and many, many, many more. Whatever the subject is, I quote the word of God. Because it is that word of God that's going to combat the fear that the devil's trying to impregnate my mind with. I've got to replace the baby that got impregnated in my mind of fear and abort that baby and let God's baby of the word of God get birthed into my mind and into my spirit. I like what he said, Moses said to the people there. He said, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Do you know how difficult it is to do nothing? Don't you feel like a sorry, good for nothing bum when you've got a situation and, and you think to yourself, well, I need to get a second job. I, I, I need to get some more money coming, flowing through the bank account. So I, I'll do this or I'll do that or I'll sell this and I'll, I'll sell that. and I'll, I'll have a yard sale. I mean, our mind goes to what can I do before we say, Lord, what can you do? And we got to change that. we got to get out of the habit of trying to fix everything ourselves. I'm preaching to me today more than anybody I believe. <laughs> but it, regardless of what you're going through, we got to stand still and realize that God is not asleep. He's not on vacation. He's not taking a break. He didn't go out to, to, to take a little uh, five minutes away from the world. He is on the job. He is ready and willing and able. And he wants you to step back and let him take the forefront. Hallelujah. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In verse 14 where he said, the Lord will fight for you. I'm so thankful that the Lord is our warrior, that he wars for you and for me. Philippians 4, 6, and 7 says, be anxious for nothing. And we can stop right there and have church because that's, that's exactly where a lot of folks are. They are anxious about everything. And yet his word says, be anxious for nothing. And then he tells you what to do. In everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So just pray and tell God what's going on. And then it says in verse 7 of that Philippians 4, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. What a wonderful promise that he says there that if we will just pray, we'll just pray and literally step back and give it to God. You know how hard that is to do, though? <laughs> I'm a doer. I, I'm a doer more than I'm a prayer. And, and I have to, I, I'm more Martha than Mary. And, and, you know, Martha was in the kitchen and Mary was uh, at the feet of Jesus. I, I do both, but if I had to lean in one direction, I lean more towards the doer than the prayer. And, and I have to stop myself a lot and say, all right, doer, you better stop doing and give this to God because God's the only one that can take care of this situation. Last night, my, my, my wonderful wife, she says to me, Randy, you're going to have to give what we were talking about. She says, you're going to have to give this to God. You're, you, you try to handle this yourself and you can't do it. You're going to have to give it to God. So if I know I have to, you are going to have to too. We're going to all have to give and cast all of our care upon him because he cares for us. 1 Timothy 6, 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. 
our goal should be to fight whatever the Lord says and ever how he says to fight. Deuteronomy 20 and verse 4 says, The Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to save you. Joshua 1, 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage? Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. 2 Chronicles 20, 15, he says, Listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, you King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid or dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. We can't wrap our head around the fact it's my children, it's my grandchildren, it's my brother, it's my sister, it's my parents, it's my job, it's my finances, it's my body and my health, it's my neighborhood situation, it's my house that's falling apart or plumbing's bad or the refrigerator went out or whatever the situation is. And we put in our head that it is mine, 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 when we need to really realize it's really God's. It's really God's. And I like the fact that he, that he wound that up there by saying, and you shall hold your peace. You shall hold your peace. Some of the greatest hindrances to my faith is my own mouth. You ever been negative? I've caught myself a bunch of times being negative, forgetting the word, only talking about the issue in front of me, what's staring me in the face. And I need to move whatever it is that's staring me in the face over in the background and let God come to the forefront. And then when I'm looking at God, I can have faith in God that he's going to turn around and take care of of the situation. But I gotta learn to be still and I gotta learn to hold my peace. Sometimes we can talk ourselves into dying. Sometimes we can talk ourselves into poverty. Sometimes we can talk ourselves into losing our children, our grandchildren to the court. Sometimes we can get all kind of things going on in our head and we just we talk negative, 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 negative to the point that there is no faith going on. We got to learn to talk faith and hold our peace when it comes to trouble. Psalm 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 62.5 says, My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. You ever been quiet when you're going through a hurricane? When everything around you is going, all you can hear is the wind blowing and all the trees bending over and all the stuff flying through the air. If you've ever lived through a hurricane and seen all that, it's hard not to just look at what's going on. And that's what we do when we have trouble in our lives. We look at what's going on when God's like, I created the wind. I created the trees. I created all the atmospheric pressures that cause all this stuff. And I can just speak the word and all this stuff can be over. So we've got to get to the place where we expect that God is going to do what he said he's going to do. And, and our expectation is from him and wait silently while he does it. Now, I entitled this message that you shouldn't have to fight a war by yourself. And uh, it's important to realize that you're not alone in your situation. If, especially if you're part of a body of believers where people are agreeing with you and praying for you. So you folks are accustomed to calling Sister Lenora and Sister LaRue and y'all are, are used to calling and saying, hey, we need prayer about this and we need prayer about that and prayer chain goes out and then other people are contacted and, and then before long the whole church is praying about a situation and we pray because we know God can turn it around 
We pray because we have faith that God is listening to us. And, and so there is power when you've got more than just one person going to battle. I don't want to go through things alone. I, I don't like the alone thing. I, I like having uh, Alicia as my prayer partner. I like having my church family as my prayer partner. I have private individuals that are prayer partners to me. If I'm going through something, I'll call Sister Faye down in uh, Palatka, Florida, to Interlochen, and I'll call her up and say, Sister Faye, I need you to pray about something, and I know she'll hit the deck on it, you know. And she'll cry out to God until God hears her cry. And, and I know you have people like that, too. You don't need to fight alone. Don't hold it in and keep it to yourself. The Bible says in Matthew 18, 19, and 20, it says, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it shall be done by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst of them. So we know that if we call the prayer chain and, and, and the ladies start praying and the men start praying and the congregation starts praying that we know that we're in agreement. That there's the power of two or three and God's in the midst. And so God begins to intervene and change the circumstances. He said, if two of you, not just any old two, but two of you, he's talking about Christians, believers, people of like-minded faith. I don't call people that I know don't pray. I don't call people that I know that aren't walking with God. I don't ask somebody that I know is living in sin to pray for me. I don't waste my time with something like that. So when he says, if any of two of you agree, he's talking to believers. So if I know two people that are not faithless and they're Christians, you won't be able to get in agreement with an unbeliever. That's doing you no good. In fact, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, don't be unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. For what fellowship is righteousness with lawlessness and what communion is light with darkness. But I want to agree. I want to agree with my brothers and sisters that I know have touched the hem of his garment, that know how to pray, how to seek the face of God. I want to talk to them and have them get in agreement. If we had somebody on the piano playing in the key of C, and we had somebody on the organ playing in the key of G minor. It would sound like a horror show up in here. If this person's playing in C and that person's playing in C, you'll have music that's uh, good to the ears. But if this one's playing, I had a I had an organist one time, she was dead, played beautifully by music. But if if you change the key. You didn't, she didn't get the sign. <laughs> she was over there playing an F, and this was playing in G, in G, and it was a horror show, just a terrible horror, horror show. And that's exactly what happens in our prayer life when we're getting people that aren't in tune with the Lord praying about stuff. I know one lady, she, she's always in sin, just always in sin, always in bad circumstances, and drinks alcohol, and just lives a horrible life, and Yet she's always said, I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. And I told her, look, sis, God ain't even hearing your prayers. Because you're not right with God. How can he hear your prayer? Oh, he hears me. I said, no, he don't. There's nothing in the word that says he hears an unbeliever. And so you've got to link up with God's people. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. That means when we're praying for folks. God, if we're asking and we're knocking. I had somebody call me yesterday and they said, do you know how to cast devils out of people? And I said, absolutely. I said, do you tell me when your loved one's going to be home? And we'll come and we'll reason with their intellect to start with. And then we'll move into prayer. And then we'll begin to cast the devil out if they're in agreement. And uh, they said, oh, thank you. We'll call you. We'll call you uh, soon. I'll find out what their schedule's like. You see... They want to know, is there somebody out there that has the power to cast the devil out? They want to know, do you have a relationship with God enough so that, that you can do this for us? 
intervene. So we got to be right with the Lord, all of us. Because you never know when you're going to be called on to cast the devil out of somebody and to rebuke the enemy off of somebody's life and, and to pray healing virtue into somebody and a blessing into somebody's life. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says that may, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold, threefold cord is not quickly broken. Have you ever tied up your lawnmower to, tie, to get behind your car and you're trying to pull it or trying to pull another vehicle and you, and you buy a cord that's made about the size of my pinky? And as you start to pull, the thing pops because it's not strong enough. You've got to get one of them big old, big old ropes that there's, they're intertwined with each other. And then you can put that on the one car and put it on the other car and pull. And because it's a three-stranded cord, it cannot be broken. And that's exactly what we need to have in our prayer life. There's strength in numbers. There's strength in numbers of people praying about your situation and interceding on your behalf. Some battles are personal. Jesus went alone and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and fought the devil right by himself for that period of time. And there are times when you, just for whatever reason, have to be alone with the Lord and, and, and grab a hold of the horns of the altar and pray until you pray through and God intervenes for you. I've had times like that in my life. But most of the time, God is wanting us to get others to pray with us, especially if you've tried on your own and you can't get anywhere. Ecclesiastes 4.10 says, If one falls down, his friend can help him up. Success comes, Ephesians 4.9. Two are better than one because they have a good return. For their work. Ephesians 4.12 says. If one of prevail against him. Two shall withstand him. You remember the story. And I'm going to close with this. You remember the story in the Bible of Gideon. Who the Lord spoke to him. And told him to go lead the children of Israel. To fight the Midianites. And there were over a hundred thousand Midianites. And, and here Israel is not prepared. They've not been in a strong spiritual place. They've been in a weak place. They've been in sin. And now they got to fight an enemy and they're not ready for it. And so God speaks to Gideon and he says, Gideon, you've got too many men. Gideon's like, well, Lord, I used my brain. I used my thinking capability, my reasoning and I, I, I deduce that if I could get every able-bodied man in Israel, that we might have a chance. And God said, you're doing it in yourself, and you need to be doing it in me. And so God says, you've got too many men. Tell everybody that's scared to go home. And about 10,000 um, men um, went home because they, in fact, 22,000 men turned around and walked away, and Gideon was left with 10,000 men. And he's still shaking in his boots because that's uh, one man to every 10 of the Midianites, and, and probably even a little more than that. But even though the men were brave, God says, you still got too many men. And they went down to the creek, and God said, every man that pulls the water up to his mouth and is still looking, that's the ones I want you to keep. Everybody that puts their mouth down to the water and sucks up from their lips to the water, set them home. I don't want them. It come right down to it. Gideon only had 300 men. Could you imagine 300 men versus 120,000 Midianite soldiers trained for battle, mighty men of valor? Could you imagine and yet that's what Gideon had to do. He had to reduce what made sense to his head and start listening to the voice of the Spirit of the Lord that was inside of him. And so here he goes, listening to the Lord. And the Lord says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to surround the camp. Every man get equal distance from each other. And we're going to look like a big old circle. And he says, we're going to take a vase. And I want every man to hold a vase in his hand. 
And I want you to hold in the other hand a, a uh, torch. I want you to break the, break the, the uh, pitcher and wave that and scream the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And the Midianites got so confounded. God came and made the Midianites look like Israelites. And they wound up killing the majority. And what was left took tail and ran, took tail and ran away from this little 300 man army. You see, you might feel like you're just, it's just you and your husband. It's just you and your children. It's just you by yourself. You might feel all alone. And you might feel like, you know, you can be in a crowded room and still be alone. Have all the people around you and you feel alone inside. Well, the Lord wants you to know that you're not alone. He has got your back and he's got your situation in hand. You just have to turn it over to God and stand still and see what God can do. You know, I started writing a book on the miracles that God has done in my life. and I've got so many pages of things that God has done. And, and when I go back and read them sometime, just to encourage myself in the Lord, I look back and I say, you know what, God? I worried about every one of those situations. I wasted so much of my life worrying and fretting and being upset about all those things. And not one time that I laid awake all night long thinking of ways that God could fix it, did he ever use one of my ideas? Not one time. Every one of those events, he did it his way. And it blew my mind. And if you'll trust the Lord today, he'll blow your mind. And he'll make a way where there is no way, he'll do what no man can do. You trust him. You trust him. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, these are your people. And God, they're, they're going through stuff. They got sick children, sick grandchildren, sick great grandchildren. They've got uh, sisters and brothers that are, have diseases and sicknesses. And they've got financial problems. And they've got cares and neighbors and work problems and issues on the job and issues in their neighborhood and they've got stuff that they're worried about. Father, help them to stand still and be quiet and trust you because you've never failed us and you're not going to start today. And we trust you and we turn, we cast all of our care upon you because you care for us and we give you our problems right now. We name it before you. In our privacy of our mind, we, we, we pray and we say, Oh, Lord, who can read our thoughts and mind? We give you this situation and we turn it over to you and say, Have your way, Lord. Have your way. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for meeting the needs today and healing bodies and delivering. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing and that you're going to do in the week to come. We bless you and we say, use us any way you want to use us this week. In the name of Jesus, amen. We love you. Don't forget about uh, the announcements about the baby picture. You're going to need to take a snapshot of it if you could. And if you have
have electronic version, email it to me or Facebook Messenger to me or text it to me, however, or bring it to church and I'll snap it here in the building. And um, don't forget that on Christmas Day, we're going to have a service at 1030 to about 1115, Christmas communion service. And then um, our banquet is going to be on the 18th, I believe it's the 18th, and it's going to be soup, chili, that kind of thing, bring a soup or a whatever your favorite soup is, make it and bring it, and we're all going to just eat some soup and drink tea <laughs> and maybe some bread. It's going to be light. And uh, God bless you. Love you.